my name's Warren Slater, for those that don't know, and I'm chairing the meeting this evening. Now, um, we've got some other advisors on hand. I've been looking around the room, and I've seen a lot of invites out to people, and we've got some, a wealth of experience. That if we need to call on any of those experienced people, ex councillors etc., they are available, and I'm fairly confident that they'd be more than happy to speak if need be. So what I'd like to start off with an introduction. Larry Mitchell made us an offer to come north with his presentation to inform us as an independent of the current financial situation that our district councils are taking us into. In some ways, Larry is possibly shooting himself in the kneecap. His client base for many years has been district and regional councils in New Zealand and overseas. In the past, Larry has been treated as a wealth of knowledge to many of these councils. Larry invited all three district councils in Northland, that's the uh, Far North, Kuiper and Whangarei district councils, to see his presentations, and to date, all have declined. Some councils don't want to hear what Larry has to say. But Larry believed the people of the district deserved to know the real facts in the winterless north. So he believed we needed to know, and that's why you all invited along this evening. Now it's quite funny, Larry's not a common name. There's not a lot of Larry's. And when the invitations started going out, I, I got an email through, and I'd just like to read it to you because I thought it was funny. You mightn't think so. And as a new teacher was trying to make use of her psychology courses, and she started her class by saying, everyone who thinks they're stupid, stand up. After a few seconds, Larry stood up. The teacher says, do you think you're stupid, Larry? And Larry says, no, ma'am, but I hate to see you standing there all by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit more to the story because Larry's seen us standing up here in Northland experience some financial difficulties. He offered to come up to give us some sound facts to enable us to make the necessary changes we hope will guide us on a road to recovery. You can't make changes or improvements without firstly admitting you have a situation that needs addressing. Maybe we need to change the way we think, and there also may be need for a culture change in our councils. There's no point in burying your head in the sand and the hope it will go away. Just look what's happened recently in the Kuiper. And didn't they say the Titanic was unsinkable? Anyway, what I'd like to do is now uh, introduce Larry. And Larry Mitchell, if you'd like to come forward. And then Larry's got a presentation which will take some 45, 50 minutes. And then at the end of that, we'll have a question and answer time. And we'll have a mobile microphone, more than happy to pass it around. So, Larry Mitchell. Welcome to Thank you very much, Warren, and uh, good evening, and kia ora, everybody. It's great to see such a gathering here tonight. Um, we had a, a very interesting meeting of ratepayers in Kuiper last night, not quite as many people, but the issues are pretty much the same right across New Zealand, and I hope... Uh, for the sake of Whangarei ratepayers, that you can go away tonight with a good appreciation of just what the financial circumstances and the economics, to some degree, of your wonderful district uh, is and are. Um, I will take about 45, 50 minutes, and it's a PowerPoint presentation which goes by the name of the 10 biggies when I present it to councils. Uh, and um, I'd like to just start perhaps with the first slide. That's where I live. It's at Puhoi, which is part of Northland. It's where the Tortora begins. And so we think of ourselves as part of Northland, or I do. Uh, when I moved to Puhoi 17 years ago, uh, I noted that uh, the name of the road where I live, at Carrie Glen Lodge, uh, riddled under the name of Fiddler's Hill which wasn't a great address for a chartered accountant. So <laughs> I now call myself a local government finance and policy analyst, brackets local government. Bit of a mouthful, but that describes what I've been doing now for at least the last 15 years, and I love every minute of it. I love it because of the people such as yourselves. That is, it's community-based. Every district has got uh, citizenry 
who are keen to see the district do well, and I include in that certainly the elected members who put their names forward. Unfortunately, the best of intentions, I feel in some cases, are thwarted by circumstances, thwarted by uh, matters that arise uh, within the administration of the council itself. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about that. Um, I'd like to firstly start... by pointing out briefly this article in today's Advocate. I don't know how many of you have read it. It's titled Masters of the Black Arts, and it's by Nikki Muir. It talks about governance, it talks about the position that uh, CEOs, and in one case the Mayor, have got to, and I'm afraid to say that it's a pattern that's developed under the uh, 2002 Local Government Act, where the CEO is given enormous powers. And you've seen what can happen in different councils around uh, the country. Now, I don't have a downer on the CEOs, but I think the what's reflected in that article, and I suggest you all read it, please, is because it, it hits the nail on the head in terms of the culture of, let's say, the internal management of a council uh, versus the ratepayers. We're supposed to be on the same side, but uh, I think in reading Nikki's article, you'll find that there are people these days who, with the benefit of the legislation that they're administering, um, perhaps lose the plot, or perhaps they've been in their jobs too long. Um, right, well, let's kick off and we'll try, we'll try this machine. I'd certainly like to thank uh, the, the people that have organised this, particularly Warren, his wife, and others who've uh, gone to a lot of trouble to organise this evening's um, meeting. Um, what I'm producing is what I consider to be independent, contestable information. That is, I don't have any axe to grind, I look at the evidence, and apparently councils are either scared by the numbers or they have their own advisers. But uh, Warren has correctly said that I'm finding it difficult getting any traction with the councils, so for the first time I've decided, A, to produce the lead tables, which is a ranking of councils, are not the most popular move from council's point of view because that's a measurement device and secondly because uh, the councils have determined that uh, the stuff that I produce is not the sort of stuff that they want to know. Um, so it's based on evidence, it's based on facts and I don't want to get into any local uh, issues and squeaky wheel stuff. This is really a presentation that, that is designed to inform rather than to have any robust political debates they can follow. That, that's the local issues that can um, be followed uh, after this meeting if need be. There's a lot of change in the wind uh, for local government over the whole country and I'll say a bit more about that shortly. There's also obviously if you read the newspapers all sorts of ideas about what happens in the north. The Whangarei District Council, did they want to know what were the decisions made in terms of whether they wanted to take part in a presentation of this kind or not? They'll have the benefit of the PowerPoint um, uh, on my website so they can look at the numbers if they want to. That's the PowerPoint from tonight's presentation. And I'd like to acknowledge Nikki Muir. I don't know whether Nikki's here tonight. Um, she is? Yeah. It is extremely heartening to see an article like that. Uh, I, I realise that it's got some uh, heat in it from the local situation, but it's actually right on the money in terms of the governance issues that are starting to show up. Now, I produce every year, and I have done for the last 15 years, a set of uh, statistics uh, and performance reports based on those statistics. I spend, while, the, uh, while you're at the beach, I spend most of my uh, December through to February pulling all the data out of the annual reports, the annual plans, and I put them into a product called Base Stats with Trends, and you'll see some of the graphs in tonight's presentation. They're the only set of performance statistics uh, on local government in New Zealand, and uh, I don't know whether any of you know of da David Farrer, he was actually on Radio New Zealand today. He runs a website uh, that's absolutely compulsory reading for people in Wellington at least, a blog site called um, Kiwi Blog. And uh, I sent the statistics of the, the local government league table to David, and he was kind enough to uh, comment on his, uh, on his blog that isn't it amazing that 
a website of a small firm like Larry Mitchell's can have more information on the performance criteria and, and the, the way in which councils are being managed, but particularly the performance uh, reports um, on that website that any one of the councils around New Zealand have got. And I'm going to be talking a bit about the change of culture that might be necessary to get councils to recognise that they do business for ratepayers and that they should be reporting and, and showing their performance on an improvement basis. The Northern Advocate has been wonderful um, in terms of uh, taking the lead table, which is really where all this started, uh, because we'll come to that soon. Um, but um, one of the reporters who's since moved uh, down south, unfortunately, Joseph, Joseph Aldridge, wonderful chap who did his homework and uh, produced a couple of uh, reasonably good, uh, very good uh, items in the advocate that started the ball rolling. So we've got the league table which has been running now for three years and you'll see some parts of it for the extracts for this presentation and uh, it's an attempt to rank the councils on some criteria which I'll describe. Um, I want to cover some of the reforms that are in the wind and late breaking news. I've spent two days in Wellington just recently talking to people who are very concerned about local government and how it fits into New Zealand Incorporated's attempt to get out of the recession, to improve our standard of living, to develop infrastructure and central government are extremely concerned about local government at the moment. Um, they've almost got to the point of having had enough. So I'm one of those glass half full guys. I think that now we will see some serious reform and uh, it will be, if I get an opportunity, I'll be happy to be part of it because it's something that I've been uh, writing about, talking about and acting upon for the last 15 years. Um, Warren is going to give you the opportunity at the end of the uh, session to have a discussion. We've got some questions uh, that we uh, will discuss. I've got to admit, I've done a bit of homework on some of them. And what I don't want to do in, in red is to relitigate or even enter into the discussion on the rights and wrongs of the Hunter Busser. Um, I'm taking a position on anything that the Whangarei District Council does or plans to do based on can they do it from a financial, from a prudent financial perspective. It's not the issue itself, it's really the underlying finances as to whether it's a good thing to do for you people to make up your own mind on. And I'd like to also uh, take the opportunity now because of the advocate uh, featuring uh, the response to the results in the lead table from the finance officer, who I know quite well at Whangarei, and um, amongst some of the misinformation that was uh, a, a riposte to the results of the lead table, and as far as I know, uh, the council hasn't read the lead table. Um, it's available on my website. Um, the response was that, uh, well, how can these figures in the lead table be right when we've just received from the funding agency a credit rating from, I'm not sure whether it was Moody's or Standard & Poor's, uh, a double A minus credit rating. And I thought to myself, well, that sounds pretty good. Double A, if it was, let's say, a, a private firm or even if it was an individual, that double A would catch in the mind of, of Joe and Josephine Public and that would probably come across as sounding like it's pretty good. So I did a bit of legwork and found that of the, eight, of the ten councils that have gone into this new funding agency, um, Whangarei ranks eight out of ten with an AA minus. You see the difference between a, a private firm and a local government organisation is that councils have a taxing authority and so their revenue is pretty much guaranteed, quite different from Fisher and Pikele who have to uh, chase the market and produce goods and do things whereas councils have got the right to charge their citizenry. So that's one of the reasons why the bankers and the rating agencies bring up the rating to that AA level. But I, I wanted you to know that if that's a response to the, uh, to the findings from the league table, it's a very weak one. So to get to the presentation itself, um, the objectives are to conduct the review and a presentation of the Whangarei District Council's vital statistics in financial and economic terms, introduce just briefly a number of local government reform issues for wider debate, and then facilitate the discussion as to what next for Northland, Whangarei, and also perhaps some discussion on where the reforms are taking us. Right, let's get into it. Where did all this begin? Well, it began with the issuance for the third time, as I say, of the league tables. 
and uh, Whangarei last year was 63rd out of the 73 councils with the merger of the Auckland units into the local into the Auckland council uh, that number dropped to 67 so the relative position for Whangarei this year is about the same 62nd uh, fifth from the bottom a little surprising to me that it was that low but I just do the numbers and that's what came out of the methodology which I'll describe briefly the northern advocate on July the 27th had those headlines and they didn't appear to be interested apart from some rejoinders as to a double A minus rating. They didn't appear to want to engage in a serious discussion about their finances. So this is it, folks. The council's response was, I guess, emu in the sand. Uh, some press coverage, but really quite a minimal response to um, the, the challenge that I guess the league table represents. Now, they certainly weren't alone in that. It's a very unpopular initiative, and as uh, Warren has said, perhaps I've shot myself in the foot. But I think it's too important for ratepayers and people in New Zealand to just uh, accept the stuff that's dished up by the council and say, well, that's gospel. Let's have some contestable independent advice, and let's see the evidence as to whether these councils are doing, are doing well or not, and hence the league table. The, we'll be concentrating on the debt and the financial position of the council. There is the concept of grouping, that is, the councils, because they all operate under the same legislation, are pretty much like with like, but they differ in terms of size, their character, and my base stats with Trends has four separate groups, um, metro down to rural, and the G9 group was one of the first groups that we used of comparable councils, and it's always included Whangarei. Whangarei, incidentally, for years took the stats that I uh, produce, and and uh, so it, it's 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 quite disappointing that lately the, the current management have decided to do without them, um, because they certainly track and show progress and performance improvement or the reverse. So we've got the standard G9 group. We've, I've also done some stats where I've grouped the three TLAs in, in the Northland area into a small group and I'll make the distinction as we come to the graphs. The first one is debt per ratepayer. Now that's a graph that comes from the base stats with trends and it's uh, a, a very good graph because it reduces uh, as a, a denominator the numbers of ratepayers. So it's really saying whatever your population size, this is the debt on a per ratepayer basis. And after all, ratepayers are the people that pay the interest and other bills. There was a time when the maximum prudent level, this was back in the late 90s, for debt within any New Zealand council was about $1,500. You can see that in this year, 2007, the debt was a little bit over 3000 In fact, that's, that grouping there is the, uh, the Northland group of the three TLAs, Kaipara, Far North and Whangarei. And, all, uh, and uh, Whangarei in, in uh, 2007 had the highest debt per ratepayer. That purple line um, is the, uh, the group average and the dotted line is the sector average for all 67 or 73 councils. You can see that it's inexorably rising, as is the group, of course, and the, the Kuiper position at that point would have influenced that. It'll be off the scale next year when they book all of the debts for all of the councils. Incidentally, these are the 2011 audited figures. So that's June 2011 and it'll be uh, two or three months before we get the annual reports and the, and the financial accounts from the councils for the 2012 period. So Whangarei has been sitting at the highest out of the group for most of those years. It's slipped down to second midpoint largely because of the aberration of Kaipara. Interesting too that the long-term plan that's just been, uh, that's the 10-year plan to 2022, um, has forecast a flat debt at about the same level per ratepayer for the whole period. So that uh, in 10 years' time, with 45,000 people on their population 
um, estimates, which they've said I think is about 500 new ratepayers a year. Um, they'll reach 200 million of debt, which is still roughly the same figure as we've got now, 4,500 as opposed to 4,444. Any questions on that? What I should say is that my estimates of debt are kosher. That is, I take term liabilities and I add to that current liabilities, largely because councils uh, with their debt figures uh, operate a smoke and mirrors policy. Uh, with internal borrowing and so on, it is very difficult even for an analyst to determine what their true debt is. So I say, well, pardon my French bugger that, we'll make it the same for everybody and just add all the liabilities on a uh, conceptual framework basis, that's what the Accountant Society would do. It's not any of the Mickey Mouse accounting that, that uh, many of the councils have got themselves tied up in. Which one would have to suspect is, is there for a purpose, that debt is a, a sensitive issue and anything they can do to minimise the apparent level of debt they will do. Um, and so this is the, at least it's the same for every council on a like with like basis. But the figures that I come up with are generally higher than councils systematically. Now what's happened to um, the uh, results, that is the, the, the profit and loss if you like, we call it deficit or surplus over the last five years for Whangarei and for, in this case again, the three Northland councils. Well you can see that the council, uh, this council has gone uh, from uh, surpluses, that's above this line, there's the line there, the zero line, they had surpluses in those two years but now small deficits or actually a small surplus, I think, and a, and a deficit there. And their, their deficit is accumulating small deficits over the last three years, but variable data, so I, I have a data caution on that. They also, and we'll come to this again, they're the second lowest within their G9 group of a thing called ratepayer equity per ratepayer. Now that sounds very pointy-headed accounting, but what it's really saying is if you're a householder, uh, and you've got a, a, an asset at your house of $400,000 and you've got a loan of $200,000 then your equity in that house is $200,000, correct? Well on this same basis the ratepayer's equity that you as a ratepayer uh, really are the owners of uh, with the uh, balance sheet equation that is assets less liabilities you have got, um, in the G9, you've got a very low rate par equity, 8 out of 9, 9 for the G9 group. So coupled with the deficits and coupled with that very low rate par equity, um, Whangarei is not well placed right off the bat uh, in terms of finances compared to the others, or compared to anything for that matter. Right, well this is the, the rate payer equity figures and I'm sorry if you can't see them up the back but I'll read them if I, if I can. This is the 2011 figure. Those, there's 34,000 for Whangarei, 42,000 for the far north and 30,000 for Kaipara. So that is the number of rate payers divided into the net worth of the council. You see what I mean? So if, if these were individuals then obviously the best place is the far north because they've got a bit more equity, uh, either less debt or higher valued assets. And of course Kaipara, um, their figure of, uh, when it comes around to June of 2012 will be lower than that. The interesting thing here is because this is measuring the financial, I'd say robustness or the strength of the council's financial position. Now what about over the rest of the country? Well, the, the average for the Northland group is 36,000, okay? The average over the whole country is 48,000. So the Whangarei District Council is sitting in the midpoint for the group of the Northland councils, but it's sitting a long way below the New Zealand average. I think we've, I think we've got some more data on that on another slide. I couldn't resist putting this up because it's just appeared on the, on the uh, Stats New Zealand website and it's the New Zealand sector, that is all 60, no in fact it's, it includes the regionals as well, so it's about 75 councils around the country and the deficits that they've been running, that's the annual result like a profit or a loss. 
And the disturbing thing here is that the operating surplus deficit, where that's the zero line, has gone from the small surpluses in those two years, the same years that we're looking at before roughly, to accumulating large deficits. And I know this is concerning people in, in Wellington because at a time when they are trying to engineer some infrastructure uh, development to get the economy going again, this is not helping because councils are up against their debt ceilings. It would appear from this stat, this particular graph, that they are using whatever reserves they've got just to keep the show going. Of course, they've got the, the benefit of being able to put the rates up to whatever level they feel can be tolerated. And I think we've got some more of that to come. But uh, what the ratepayers will say about that, they'll be marching with pitchforks down the main street if they want to get back to a position that's, let's say, break even. Legally, incidentally, they should be within a bull's roar of that zero line on a, on a balanced budget basis. What's interesting here is that this is a true result to the extent that that, leaves, that particular calculation leaves out some accounting sophistry uh, which often uh, brings in surpluses from vested assets, um, from uh, revaluations of uh, assets. Uh, those are really just book entries. This stuff is the real cash deficit in this case. Now, what it means for next year and, and for the future for all of the local government sector is something of grave concern. And I, I don't overstate my case there because I know just how concerned particularly the people in Wellington are. When they can't get out of local government the infrastructure development that they were hoping for, they say, what the hell's going on? Now this is a bit advertorial, and I'll, I won't go into it too much, except to say that the base stats with trends has got a mini GDP in it. That is, there are 30 measures within the, the, the reports that you might be interested in, because this tracks over five years just how well the mini economy of every one of these district councils around the country is doing. And uh, all I can say there is that um, the mini G GDP, that's the, the share of the nation's GDP that resides here in Northland, then um, Whangarei, not surprisingly for an urban authority, is, has got the best stats, uh, but it's lowest amongst the small city group of the true G9 peers. So uh, that just reflects some of the stats we'll be looking at shortly, which are a question of um, the demographics and the income earning capacity of the district. This is also neither here nor there, in that it's really just a size ranking. It's information only. Um, Whangarei is second in size. It's quite a large part of that group of nine amongst its true peers. And you can have a look on the website at that graph a bit further if you like. It's just got a measure of some sizes. Here's one that usually gets them exercised. Um, there are a number of benchmarks in the reports. This is one that I thought you might be interested in. It's the CEO's package related to total revenue. There's about five or six measures relating the CEO's uh, emolument, a remuneration package, to the total revenue ratio. I was a bit naughty when I put that stuff together. I thought, well, once again, that word again, bugger it. Let's see what it shows uh, from council to council. So sometimes when I sell my reports, they, they stay in the CEO's bottom drawer possibly because it's got something to do with these sort of ratios. In this case, just for the group of three in Northland, the CEO's package, based on a measure of total revenue, is the first out of third, neither here nor there, but second out of nine amongst the other peers around the country. Quickly moving on. This is one where I have a data issue. You realise we haven't had a census for seven years but it'll be eight years before we get new data on a lot of this stuff and unfortunately it affects the data that I've got to work with in terms of district incomes. However, that aside, um, this shows the proportion of fixed income earners, that's the beneficiaries, people on unemployment benefit, superannuitants, a whole collection of, of people who are basically on fixed incomes as a proportion of the population. And in this case, um, th this is the lowest 
uh, most favourable of these income measures compared to the other Northern councils. And interestingly enough, it's about midpoint amongst the larger group. But as I say, a big question, a big question mark over the income-related data. Now here is a, a, a summary of the, the results from the league table. And it's a bit out of place here, but I'll try and describe what, it, what it's talking about. It's looking at New Zealand councils, all of the councils, their sustainability measures. I'll come back to that in a minute. But the interesting thing is, based on the five measures of sustainability within the league table, these are league table results, um, and there's that ratepayers equity per ratepayer again, and you can see there's that 45,000 average, 48,000 in, in 2012 compared to your 36, was it? 34 or something. But in each case, the, the movement on these sustainability measures between the two years has got either better or worse. So we've got challenging, uh, obviously recession-influenced economics around the country, and that's reflecting in the, uh, the, the uh, league table results for sustainability. The next one affects the same council group, all of them, and it's affordability that's measured here. Here we've got a slightly different mix. There's some better, there's some that are square or even. Um, the recession stubbornly persists and the census data on income applies. So between the two years, we didn't see any startling improvements. In fact, if anything, we saw a further slide from good to less good or worse. Now, I just want to talk briefly um, about the uh, league table. The league table was devised three years ago, largely on the basis of saying, all right, what can we look at within public information about councils? What could we look at uh, by way of public information that we could put into, a, let's say, a league table that would be meaningful to the ratepayers? So we devised uh, some measures. There are 10 metrics and there are some other factors. Remember those points. There are 10 metrics on sustainability. There are five. Affordability, there are five. And there are a range of other factors. And all of those, as an amalgam, gets you to the point where you can rank a council based on financial sustainability. Now that is sustainability from a financial perspective of the council itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Affordability is the other metric, five measures for that, and that's the affordability of the community. That's the demographics, that is the ability to pay for council services. So within those ten metrics you've got is the council sustainable in financial prudent financial terms? And is this, are the services that the council are delivering to the population, the residents and ratepayers, <coughs> excuse me again, are they affordable? And in addition to that, what other things, other factors might influence a, a ranking? Like how about an earthquake? Or how about leaky buildings? And there's another monster that's coming and that is earthquake rectification. That's the strengthening of buildings. So when you look at all of those things across uh, the sector, we've come up with a ranking of from 1 to 67 this year. And it's interesting that the Presbyterian is down in the deep south, the Clutha and the central um, Otago people who've got no debt or low debt are ranked first and second this year and last year they were second and first. So that shows that the, the table itself is quite robust and given the importance in the uh, sustainability data of debt, it's hardly surprising that the high debt councils are those at the bottom, coupled with the fact that if their uh, income stats and their affordability stats are not flash either, that's how you get Whangarei to 62 out of 67. In the case of, let's say, Central Otago, I guess they're making a few bucks down there as well on an income basis, but they certainly haven't got any of the major debt problems. Uh, so I think there's a lesson in that for North Island councils. Now I'll quickly just look at um, where we go on um, Whangarei. Um, they had, uh, their audit opinion was delivered on time and unqualified. They've got poor commercial assets, that is they don't actually own many commercial assets. They've got poor financial assets, in fact very poor. They've got a good investment property. 
but they've got relatively high debt. That's probably a, a sort of a yes and no a bit. But they've got very low financial assets, and I'll come back to that. Uh, these are just numbers, and notice that they've gone from a green traffic light to a downgrade this year. That was last year's traffic light position. Notice that Kuiper went from yellow to double red. Uh, we had to introduce a double red this year. Um, and that's a single red. So that is a downgrade, but not, of course, to the extent of, of, of or uh, to the extent that it's a double red. The, those measures have been omitted from this part of the table. And notice that this is the other factors. I'm doing it sort of um, backwards at the moment, but those are the other factors that relate to the group here. You can see these. Like, I mean, for example, Kuiper was always going to be uh, marked down because they've only just filed their annual report and the audit opinion wasn't available when we did the... Uh, none of that accounting information was available, nor was it audited at the time that we did the, uh, the league table. Whangarei, um, largely because of the, the, the yellow to... Sorry, the, the green to red has got a weaker 2011 position and recall the fact that, you know, that's, that's still one of those key factors in terms of the strength or weakness of the council, the ratepayer equity per ratepayer for the Whangarei District Council is a quite a low 34,000. Here's the actual table itself, and uh, I've got copies of the, the full uh, document here if you want to have a look at it afterwards. So here's this group of uh, three Northland councils again. There's the Northland average, they're just numbers. Uh, I can go into those if you like. Here are some of the comments about it. There's the repeat of the other factors going from the green to, to red. And overall, um, the final assessment was poor. Whangarei has gone from 63rd last year down to 62. And this is the, these are the metrics that are scored. Um, and the other factors obviously have been quite influential in that downgrade, or at least retaining that position around about 62nd out of 67. Now this you might find interesting, it's one of the few uh, reasonably reliable rates surveys that are conducted annually. The Napier City Council very generously do a, a questionnaire of, of the councils that form that, um, that group there. And uh, here, we couldn't do this at Kuiper last night, um, but here Whangarei is one of the G9, this is the original G9 almost. Um, and their results over the, uh, for average residential rates, it doesn't say anything about commercial industrial rates, but their numbers for Whangarei are almost on the average after, what, six years of 17, can you see that, 1767, as opposed to the average of, can you see that, 1728, isn't it? Yeah. Or was that 1328? <coughs> oh, thank you, that's a relief. Um, which indicates a 21% increase over that five year period, a 22% increase for Whangarei for just residential rates. Um, over that period. So at least it gives, it gives you a peg in the ground as to whether on this basis, and it's a very slim basis, uh, whether Whangarei's rates are high, low or medium in terms of uh, its peers. So in this case, as of when these results came out, there'll be some more information that we'll add to that stack um, in, in 2012. So we'll see what the, the situation is vis-a-vis -vis its peers uh, in terms of average residential rates. Not too many more to go, so I'll gallop through these. Uh, where to for Whangarei and Northland? Well, I would say this, because it's been my business and still remains my business, that is council performance improvement. Um, we should be seeing councils involved in some form of performance improvement program, but we're not. I don't know if any of you that have been in uh, the private sector, you'd be aware of the Baldridge Award or the ISO 9000 or any one of a number of different schemes that says, right, we are here, we want to be here. How do we get there? Well, we embark upon a performance improvement program. Now, some people would say that's not the way to go, but as a default position, it's not a bad thing to do. When I last looked, uh, a mini survey I did about two years ago, there were only 12 councils in New Zealand that had anything, anything that looked like a performance improvement program. And I say, why? They should all be on some form of performance improvement program that is measured, set goals at every level, from the, the, the custodian of the, of, of the uh, 
uh, of the gym right through to the CEO. And of course you can apply that to the performance of um, elected members too if you wish. There should also be some performance measurement with, worthy of the name. We're getting PR statements now from councils. There's very little that as an analyst I can get my teeth into and unfortunately my council, the Auckland Council, is one of the worst. It's all just PRBS, uh, lots of initials, but um, uh, it doesn't actually tell, if an analyst can't get a handle on whether a council has improved, gone sideways or gone south, then what chance does uh, average Joe and Josephine ratepayer have? What about a public awareness, or what about a public performance and awareness survey? They conduct surveys, but often they're not all that independent. Um, what we should be seeing is at least uh, some questions asked, the hard questions, as to whether you think the council has improved on a, a range of criteria, and that should be part of uh, an overall comprehensive performance improvement program. This word affordability, thank goodness, is starting to come into the vernacular of long-term plans. But when you look at the long-term plans that have just been issued, they haven't tried to level the increases, that is, of rates, of debt and costs. They're still the same upward sloping graphs. So the message hasn't got through that people are hurting out there, that affordability is an issue, that median incomes are not progressing at the same rate as council's costs, and they're continuing to plan for a sloping upward to the right set of curves when, I'll give you an example of one council back in, it was a client of mine, uh, I'm proud to say, the Hutt Council back in 1998 decided to embark on a performance improvement program. They were getting hell in the, in the local media because their rates were going up um, and so they said there was a determined team of the Mayor the CEO and a couple of, of, of management people, including a very fine finance guy uh, who's now the CEO, they said, right, enough's enough. We'll make do with our old council building. We'll start to cut our cloth. We'll stick to the knitting. And you know what? Within six years or seven years, they won the New Zealand Business Excellence Gold Award. They were the top organisation in the country against all comers, including private sector companies, uh, Fletcher Challenge and Fisher and & Pike included. So it can be done. Now why is it not happening in practically every council around the country? We're getting the reverse. Take a drive over to Dargaville and talk to a few people over there. So in terms of, uh, of affordability, we've got to see improved cost effectiveness. That is the, the, the conversation when long-term plans are being devised has got to include can we afford it? How often do you hear that? It's more a matter of let's just do the same old and let's see what sort of uh, castle we can build this particular three year term. This is a favourite of mine. I'm a recovering auditor. I spent uh, three years on secondment with um, the OAG and uh, I, I got very interested in uh, local government um, audit and accounting at that stage. Uh, around about um, 1993, 94, it seems a long time ago now, but I never forgot the lessons about how an active and uh, passionate bunch of auditors could try and do their best to see that, uh, uh, particularly councils in that case, stayed on the rails. And I spent uh, most of my three years involved in an investigation into the cost overruns of the AAT Centre, you might remember that. And uh, I earned the spurs on that, and we could almost say that at least for the next 10 years, councils didn't dare uh, overrun their costs or create those monsters uh, like the AAT Centre, largely because of that report. What we've got now amongst the audit fraternity, and they've got egg all over their face in Kuiper, um, is that they are not active enough they pick up their annual audit fee and take the money and run. And I haven't really seen any uh, projects, hard-hitting forensic projects or even value-for-money projects coming out of the local government cell in Wellington for a long, long time. And so some of the discussions I'm having in Wellington at the moment are precisely along those lines. At the time that um, 
we were discussing about where should councils go in terms of reform, um, and I'm wel you're welcome to get a copy of it off my website, is a, a paper that I've just done on issues, tactical issues, points on the board issues, that could be immediately implemented, because you'd be aware that local government reform is happening. This is one man's view of things that could happen now. No need for changes of legislation, we could do it within the context of how we operate councils at the moment. And there's some of these uh, elephants in the room that have been there for a long time. I'll give you an example of one of them. There's eight of them. I could have got maybe 18. How about this one? How long ago, or no, when was it, if ever, you last saw a percentage rates increase announced that 12 months later a council reported as actual? Because that's just budget, isn't it? How do we know that the percentage rates increases that they're announcing are in fact correct? Is there not an incentive for councils to understate the percentage rates increases, particularly when there's a, a, an election around the corner? Now, I'm, am I just being unduly suspicious? I don't think so. But at the moment, this is one area of, of major public in, interest that has no audit coverage, and here we are, we sit meekly by, and the media do their best, but they don't do a great deal other than report what the council has said the rates increase is going to be. Here's another one, and I said I'd say something a little bit about it. It gets a bit techo. This one here. Anyone that's being charged, let's say, a targeted rate for their water or wastewater, within that charge on an annual basis, there will be an amount calculated that you pay as a ratepayer that pays for and supposedly puts aside a reserve for the replacement of those assets. And that's carefully calculated through an asset management plan and they look forward to where the asset needs replacement or major maintenance. So you're paying for it as it goes, which is fair enough. But hello, what's happened to the funds? And I was talking to Bill Harris uh, just before the meeting. In the old days, they used to put that money aside in things called sinking funds, which was considered by the, the white boys, the treasury management gurus, to not be such a flash idea. And they had some reasonable grounds for saying that it doesn't make any sense in accumulating large amounts of cash. But what's happened here, and this is a major concern to the people in Wellington that are looking now for the money that you and I have put aside into reserves, it hasn't been invested in sinking funds. It might be sitting there in the balance sheet apparently as an asset replacement reserve, but there's no funds on the other side of the balance sheet to back it up. That money has been raided right across the whole sector. This idea of treasury management will have the money when we need it. There's a lot of horse manure because the money has been spent. Many of the councils are up to what are reasonably up to the level of the maximum prudent debt. And I could, I could go on at some length about this, but it's a major concern that your money is being taken, supposedly reserved, but not invested and used for all sorts of stuff. There I suggest it might even get used for an art gallery. Probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so... The, the rationale for the paper was that central government, and this is a bit advertorial, but the central government might wish, independent of the usual process and sectional interest, because what happens is that the usual suspects, what I call the cosy club, um, get together and say, well look, if there's some reforms coming down the track, we're going to white ant them. Doesn't that happen? That is, it's in the interests of some of the, the people that represent the bureaucrats in, in local government, and other government for that matter, to say, oh no, we can't have that. So the paper was a, 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 an attempt to say, well, here's some things that you can galvanise the reform process, kickstart it, with some early points on the board, and those four of the ones uh, of the eight that I showed you are just a case in point. The high return solutions, the low-hanging low fruit, really, because they can all happen. Uh, another one is, is, is some payroll controls. Everybody wants to know how many employees and what the payroll of a council is, but do you ever actually see any facts on it? No. Is there any way that the, the ratepayer can say that that's a reasonable number of, of, of employees or a reasonable payroll? Because the auditors don't go near it, and yet it's, it's after depreciation, it is the second major 
recurrent operating item of expenditure in council accounts. So there are lots of things that can be fixed. Depreciation is another one, but that's a real tar baby, and some of that is, is uh, more confusing even for me than I care to admit. So this time, are the reforms really underway? Well, I sincerely hope so. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity to read the, the report of the uh, review team at Kuiper, I suggest you do. If you're genuinely interested in local government affairs, or if you're thinking of standing next year as, a, as an elected member, please read that. It is a brilliant report, and the people that wrote it deserve the highest commendation. They were the minister's men, but without fear or favour, they really hooked into it. And the stuff that they've written there, plus that sort of stuff, is going to pay off, I assure you. If the people in Wellington are as serious as I think they are, we're going to see some changes in local government, and God thank the Lord for that, because it needs to be done. Most of us now have been battling against councils for a long time. Now, that doesn't mean that overnight there's going to be a conversion on the road to Damascus. It's going to take some time. That audit activism thing is going to take five years to come through. But without audit activism, we can't expect our councils, unless they're very well led, there are some exceptions. David Hall at South Waikato, Tony Stellinger at Hutt. These are people that have that responsibility to improve their organisations and they get busy and do it. But that's two out of about 80 that actually get busy and do the sort of stuff that only the auditor with a, an arm up the back can often uh, ensure happens. And they have been out to lunch for quite a while. It's about time they earned their fees. That's it. I hope that stunned look is not one of uh, complete <laughs> bemusement and I'll hand over now to, uh, to Warren to um, fire a few questions. Thank you. Larry, thank you for coming along tonight. Um, I know when I was in council we relied on your reports considerably and uh, they were the most independent feedback that we ever got. My concern is the role of Audit New Zealand. You seem to have indicated that they're not doing as well as they might. Um, and for me, they, they absolutely fail. And in trying to deal with them about issues, they're wiping us out or not bothering or saying, you know, the annual report's out or the LTP's done so we're not going to get involved. Do you think Wellington is going to take Audit New Zealand to a better level of addressing what they should be addressing under the Local Government Act? So it's more than just the financial, but the whole purpose of the Act which I believe councils and staff have become comfortable with and are not really performing. What a great question. Uh, thank you very much for that because the 2002 Act has shot through it, shot through, it is shot through with performance measurement criteria and decision making criteria that unless that's followed, then we come to circumstances a bit like we are seeing around the country now of a disconnect between council decision making and the community people who are supposed to be bottom up and providing the input. Now I know there's a lot of talk about over consulting and there's some truth in that, but what's happened is that without these performance measures that are in the Act being adhered to and with audit not seeing that they are adhered to, uh, it, anything seems to go. Now, I mean, I'm, I'm perhaps, and, I, and just thinking on what I've, I've said over the last three quarters of an hour or so, perhaps I'm um, uh, extending the analogies a bit far, and I don't mean to generalise unnecessarily, but on this audit one, we have had auditors turning up for years now, ticking boxes. They have seemed to have forgotten that they have a social responsibility to make judgments, um, they do collect a lot of money from the ratepayers. Uh, in fact, e even a little old Kuiper, they get a bill for six figures when there's a, an LTP to be audited. Uh, and I've challenged them um, through my contacts in Wellington to do a survey, another survey, of client and customer and ratepayer satisfaction. Won't that be interesting? One, whether they will do it, and secondly, whether they'll make public the findings. 
So I, I, I will do what I can to see that that sort of level of accountability is introduced because there is widespread dissatisfaction with the quality of the audit that we've been getting in local government. And that's now resonating in the circles of uh, central government in Wellington, I can assure you. Um, so that's about as much as I should probably say. Uh, but there was a time when we had an active OAG. When was, it, when was the last time you saw a report that was hard-hitting about a real matter of public interest from the audit office? It's a long time since they produced a report or even a management letter to a council that tells it like it is. I think with the people that are visiting the OAG this week and next week, that we might see some action coming out of that, uh, out that, out of that office. The final thing I'll say is, in some cases, once again, I don't want to generalise too widely, uh, widely or wildly, but their ratepayer complaints process is risible. You might as well not bother. Uh, you get a form response, and look what's happened in Kuiper, where for three or four years. People who were qualified, let's say, in, in one case in local government law, were dishing up all the chapter and verse for the auditors to uh, take uh, cognizance of, to investigate properly. All they got back for three years was just form letters saying, no, no, she'll be right, we've got it under control. So they need a real shake-up and they need some leadership that's got a bit of fire in their belly. After all, they are the ratepayers' watchdogs, not as a poodle, more as a Rottweiler, or at least a little bit of mongrel, because they have become part of the problem, they're part of the cosy club. And uh, the best thing they can do is to get out of Lambton Key drinking lattes and, and, and get round the traps and actually do some gutsy auditing. Thank you, Nancy. Pretty good comments there, Larry. Just something that come up, you mentioned before on the slide number 20 about the performance surveys. I know two years ago they did one in the Whangarei District Council and one of the questions was the degree of or percentage of satisfaction of the attendee or the performance at council meetings. Now I know there's five people and I'm one of them that normally attend council meetings and they had an 89% performance uh, was indicated. Attendance. It, well it was, 80, it was final figure was something like 89%. And the five of us that attend, and we've got a gentleman down the back who's a regular attendee, not one of us was phoned. So I don't know how they got those figures. <laughs> Might have been the silent majority. Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, we've got some more questions, please. One down the back there. Thank you. Yeah, the, <clears throat> the current government is following sort of free market policies and there's um, a lot of uh, discomfort with them after the global economic collapse. Um, if we don't follow free market policies, uh, where do you think we would go as an alternative? Well, we could elect the Labour government, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that most Kiwis are a bit of everything. There you are. That is, we might have a few ACT supporters and we might have some real deep green uh, supporters. But by and large, we elect governments that represent the middle of the bell curve. So we don't have the extremes. And I don't believe at the moment that we've got an extreme anything. That is, I don't think the National Party is extreme in terms of free market. Now, you might argue about asset sales and things of that kind. Well, we were warned and they were elected. That perhaps covers that. But I live in Puhoi and I call myself a pastel green because you can't help but love the trees and the birds even if you come from a pinstripe background in Queen Street. So I'm not trying to avoid the, the, the question but try living in um, uh, Syria at the moment. Try living in parts of, of, of uh, the Eastern Bloc. Uh, try living also in the southern states of uh, the US. You know, we have a, a, a pretty much a middle of the road government and it's reflected best, I think, in, in local government. We don't have any politics. Um, are you trying to, are you running now? 
<laughs> and I just wonder whether you're deserving the ship. Somebody trying to get in. Um, so, uh, I mean, that, that's the sort of question that I don't, as an analyst, have any particular uh, valid point of view on because I'm just another Kiwi New Zealander. So I hope I haven't avoided the question. All right. Oh, and thank you for letting that gentleman in. <laughs> Good evening, Larry. I'm Merv Williams, I'm a district councillor. How do you do, Merv? Um, I don't disagree with a lot of the uh, results that you come up with, but I disagree with some of the methodology in getting there. And my main problem in that is um, in that the information we're presented with, I think, is, is totally distorted. And uh, we talk about audit. Audit New Zealand are there to, uh, their program is to audit the accounts in terms of IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards. A little bit wider than that. Well, that's, that's, that's basically what they come along at, and that's what they say their job is. And, uh, me, but they have a wider mandate than yeah. just IFRS, which means they have to take cognizance of cost effective or the opposite expenditures of public money. Yeah, but it's, it's amazing how they get sidetracked. Yes. And, and that IFRS becomes the be all and end all. Yep. And these financial reporting standards were, were brought out at, around Enron and the, the rot of Enron in, in the States. And they are absolutely meaningless to us. And, and therefore the information that we get presented in our annual reports, a lot of the time is meaningless because we really can't, can't understand what is there. Um, so, for us, that is a real problem, both as a, as a ratepayer and as councillors, to try to get interpretation as to what is going on. I'd like you, if you can, to, yes. to give us some advice how, how we can get some, some better information. Yep. And, um, and I'd just like to, to say to people that you know, we, we rely on on good information and, and then the, sort of the type of information that should be put out is the sort of stuff that Mr. Harris wrote in the paper a couple of weeks ago there, um, where he didn't just look at um, the, uh, the amount of reported debt, he looked at uh, the total funds employed and so that we sell properties and you add that on to what, you report, what your reported debt is, you get total funds employed. So rather than talking 160 mil, we're talking 200 mil very quickly. Merv, thank you for that question. The, the, the first part of it is, um, what are we getting with public annual reports? That is the audited reports that are legally required uh, from councils. And we're getting accounting juju. We're getting a wadge of paper about that thick. And for those of you that are probably wondering what IFRS stands for, they're the International Financial Reporting Standards. and I was part of a, an unsuccessful battle in the mid-90s to get public sector accounting recognised as a separate discipline. And I think there may be some of this coming back. I mean, we've been hearing about simple, more direct use of language and of accounting numbers within public reporting, and it's, it's being worked on at the moment. Now, I don't know, I'm not part of that project, but I t couldn't agree with you more that we're getting reports that might m mean something to analysts, and I struggle, got to be honest, that is part of the reason why audit are, uh, are bedeviled by the fact that they've got huge checklists just complying with arcane accounting standards that don't actually, have, uh, don't actually meet the requirements of ratepayers who just want to know the answers to simple questions. I'll give you one quick example. If a council accepts that, and if, if we say that a council's uh, beholden duty is primarily to maintain its infrastructure, you can't go to a set of annual reports or performance reports of any kind in, in this country in, uh, for councils that tell you the answer to one or two simple questions. And the questions are these. How much did we provide this year for asset replacement? Next question. Did that add to or reduce any backlog of infrastructure deficit? That is, are we, are we keeping up with the funding requirements? And the third little question is, what was that amount? 
Now, for such a fundamental question, if we are racing around, or if the auditors and the accountants are racing around, filling out sh schedules of, of um, I mean, the Treasury notes run to about a dozen pages about counterparty uh, arrangements with any of their borrowing and hedging arrangements. Who gives a flying what have you, to be honest? If we don't know the answers to those most fundamental questions, then we've seriously lost the plot. So I sympathise with, with councillors who figure that those accounts are not giving them the information because sure as hell the ratepayers are completely bloody befuddled too. But I would say for the elected members, they have a responsibility to get from management intelligent monthly information. And if they're not getting it, they should be asking why. I'm not saying that you're not. But they're quite different things. That is, the, the reporting for external purposes at the moment is a, a tar baby because it's all tied up with uh, the accountant's way of seeing things and international standards. But if we want to have good accountability within the councils, then the councillors should be insisting on reports that they can understand, preferably just on one page. And I've seen it done. And I've seen it stuck up on the canteen notice board at South Waikato so that everybody knows just how the debtors over, over time are going as to whether they're hitting budget for their deficit or, and what their expenditures are. And, and, and people look forward to seeing that one piece of paper every month because they have set their budget, people understand what the budget is, they seem to be marching in step and they've got information that's useful. Thanks. My name is Alan Martin and in past life I was a town clerk and municipal treasurer in the good old days in the 1970s when we acted under the Municipal Corporations Act. In those days, we didn't worry about depreciation, we did cash accounting. People understood it. You did your budget for the, you, on what was coming in over the next year, what you're spending it on, including the sinking funds, which were invested in uh, government stock, the glory stock. 5% yep. was the sort of normal return. Yep. And you, when you wanted a new bulldozer, you had the money there, hopefully, to, to replace it. I think a lot of the problem, and uh, Merv's already mentioned Imron, I think a lot of it is the Emperor's New Clothes. People are too frightened to put up their hands and say, I don't understand it. And I agree completely this idea of this one page thing. It doesn't only apply to councils, it happens with a lot of uh, clubs and societies. A simple cash accounting, so that people know how much cash they've got and what they owe. And uh, the idea, I agree with you completely, that instead of talking about depreciation, we should talk about asset replacement, totally. which is separately funded. Right so on. I agree with you completely. Right yeah, no, very well said. I think you've said it all, and a lot of it comes back to that principal uh, requirement for councils to keep their infrastructure intact, and and, and that is just as you've said uh, to keep track of, of the funds that are there uh, for the purpose of, of of maintaining their service potential. And depreciation, you know, in an accounting context, in my humble opinion, doesn't have any place in local government accounting. Loss of service potential does, which is uh, what, what you're actually wasting in terms of, of an asset that you want to bring back up to a steady state. Can I just give you one quick well, on depreciation? I came up here in 1983 on a temporary assignment from Auckland to do a special audit of the Harbour Board. And it took me quite some time uh, doing the audit of the Harbour Board accounts is how you depreciated uh, dredging. So when you dug a hole in the ground, that's an asset, but when you maintain it, that wasn't. But while you were maintaining your hole in the ground, you dumped it on the side of the road and you built further land and that became assets. And it was the most interesting you know, sort of accounting concept in this arcane area of local authority accounting. Uh, we've got a gentleman over here, which is Mr. Bill Harris. And Bill, I, you haven't spoken to you about this, but you know you were actually uh, fifty something years with the council. <laughs> Bill's been pretty uh, proactive lately, writing some interesting articles in the newspaper, which has got some uh, hostile replies from people in council. But. I mean, after 50 years working there, they must have accepted him for 50 years, and after a year or two of being away, they don't accept him. So what's wrong? Bill, would you like to say a few words this evening? I think it would be uh, quite beneficial. I, I can't sum it up. A few people are ready to go home, but if you want to give me five minutes, I'm happy to. You're more than happy. <laughs> I'll, I'll go up there. I can look everyone in the eye there. <laughs> I'm not a public speaker, I'm a letter writer. 
<laughs> it's all been mentioned tonight, and Larry mentioned the um, internal borrowing. And that was, that, that's my beef with council, is that they're not being true, in my view, about our level of debt. And um, I got a copy of the plan, and there was a thing on internal borrowing. Internal borrowing, you know what it is now. You've got some money over here for your holiday account. You can't pay your power account this week, so we'll just borrow some from the holiday fund. Next month, you can't pay insurance, so we'll borrow from the holiday fund. You run your holiday fund down, there's nothing left. Now, council is allowed legally to borrow internally as well. And their policy is to be, as I understand it, it has to be paid back within seven years. So it's debt. So I got the annual plan, and they talked about this internal borrowing, but I couldn't find any numbers. So I rung up one of my friendly councillors, who's in the room tonight, and I says, why can't I find any numbers? And he says, management says that the audit department won't let us disclose the internal borrowing. That's strange. So I rang up management in the council, and the words to me were this, yes, that's built, audit insists that internal borrowing is not to be disclosed in the, in the annual plan. Uh, I actually found out later that statement is true, but it's not truthful. Does that make sense? Uh, double Dutch, how can I? Let me think if I can explain that. You want to buy a car. So you go to a car yard, and there's this nice car there, and it's got a sign on it that says, Buy this car, and we guarantee you will never, ever have any problem with the engine. So you've got to take it for a test drive, and it won't start. You lift the bonnet up, and it hasn't got an engine in it. The statement, the statement is true. The statement is true, but it's misleading. It's underhand. It's sneaky. It's devious. It's all those things, and that's how council is giving you the information about the total level of debt. I'll now refer to it as engine sign information. <laughs> and it's morally wrong. So I've worked with auditors over a long period of time, so I got in touch with the Auditor General's office, and he said, um, yes, that's correct, Bill, but it only refers to the debt line in the balance sheet in the financial accounts. That's the only time that And what that means and I think it's a technical accounting situation. Council's got $30 million on this side of the edge of the gun they're going to lend. Council's got $30 million, it's actually 40 I think, where no one knows. $30 million that they're going to borrow, one cancels the other out, so there's no need to put it in the accounts. But, and that's why I wrote the advocate, and by pure coincidence, I have a copy in my pocket. <laughs> Not that I take this to bed with me at night either. <laughs> this is also what the audit department had to say. Apart from what be can, apart from what can be included within the debt line of the balance sheet, the auditors will not be placing any limitation on disclosures, and in fact, we generally encourage more rather than less for transparency purposes. The use of reserves could usefully be disclosed to provide the readers of a long-term plan a full picture of the situation. Overall, we would encourage disclosure of external and internal debt in as clear a manner as possible. This is from the Auditor General's Office and local government. There are grounds to make clear disclosures outside of the financial statements in respect to the forecast amount of debt, internal and external the current disclosures could be improved. Now, I put in a written submission, I put in an oral, uh, oral submission, told the council all this, and just to safeguard it, because I, I wasn't sure how I was going, I'm new to uh, submissions, I haven't done it before, I went home and wrote an email to the mayor, because he wasn't at the meeting, my ward councillors, and one or two of my selected councillor friends, and I thought, right, I've got a majority here, there's going to be some real changes. What I wanted in the plan is a complete statement of debt. Yeah. In other words, here's your opening balance at 1st of July, internal or external, internal. Here's how much we're going to borrow, external, internal. Here's how much we're going to repay, external, internal. Here's the closing balance of the 10-year plan. Real simple stuff. So the final plan came out and it wasn't there. And that's why I got my knickers in a twist and went public on it. Mm. Yeah. 
So I just wasn't happy about it at all. And, um, and not a lot's changed. But the advocate, I must admit, I sent this to them within a week of the annual plan being adopted, and it took me to about oh, a couple of weeks ago to get it published. So it took a long time constantly getting on to the advocate to get him to publish it. Mm. When this hit the press, I got, a, um, got in touch with the leader, or they got in touch with me, and they were interested in it as well. And I said, well, the advocate's done a pretty good job on it, and they wanted to come to it from a different angle. They wanted to go to the council and get the council's view on it. Fine, find out why they won't publish this statement they want. So they went and spoke to the, um, and this was in last week's leader, most of you would have read it, the, one of the managing staff, and he said, yes, it's in there. All the figures you want are in there, you know, that engine sign reporting again. If it is, I can't find it, and I don't find anyone sitting in this room to find it. It's not even called internal borrowing. I think they called it application of funding operations financial costs or something. <laughs> it's, it's, look, I, I don't want to believe that the majority of councillors are deliberately doing this. But I have to believe that. I've given them all the information and they won't do it. Or otherwise, they're being led through the nose by a very small team, which includes management and some very strong councils, and I'm quite disappointed at the performance of that. And councillors have got to say, look, it's their plan, it's the information document from councillors, and they can have in the plan what they like. Now, you just talk about this financial thing, they've got certain standards to meet, and I accept that. There is nothing wrong with having things in the plan that you want to put in the plan. It's your plan. Yeah. You know, if you want those single pay, it's the same as rates. Yeah. You know, the only mention you get about rates is that we're going to increase rates by the rate of inflation. You know, most people like that say, oh, yeah, 5% a year for 10 years, it's 50%. That's wrong. Because 5% goes on, 5% goes on, it's all compounded. <coughs> why, not, why not give some examples of an average residential property or a small business something? There's nothing wrong with it. There's only a few extra pages in the document, but they won't do it. <coughs> you know? And I, I've got some... Some, some real concerns about how the finances are being managed, but that's not my task. It was just mainly this. And to me, it started with this um, $20 million for the Old Boys building, where they spent money they hadn't got. I mean, can you imagine your phone going, hello, you've got an old motorbike around the back there that's worth about $500. I'll give you 3000 for it. Sold. So the next day, you jump on a plane and go and spend a fortnight in Rarotonga, put it on your credit card. No one ever comes to buy your motorbike. Well, that's what council do with their twenty dollars. And again, when they spoke to to the chairman of the finance committee, he was reported in the paper as saying that he, as a he may have used the word statutory, I can't remember, but he had an obligation to the rate pass to put it into the plan. Engine sign information. That's true, but not in that form. It should have gone in, in my view, as a contingency. If we get $20 million, this is how we're going to spend it. Well, we didn't get the $20 million, but we just go and spend it anyway and raise another $20 million. Just unbelievable stuff to me. It really is. And what really bugs me, when you read Council's own documentation, Council, in carrying out its business, Council is required to do a number of things. These include carrying out business in a clear, transparent and accountable manner, considering community views by offering clear information. This is Council's documentation in the plan. And this is the best one. This is the one I love. I'm going to get it blown up and put it on my wall. The draft plan and its debt profile have been established after careful consideration by the Council which is mindful that the community is sensitive to public debt. <laughs> They're just words. You know, it's just like saying to someone, I love you. <laughs> or, <laughs> or I t 
turn the lights down low and <laughs> hold his other hand, look in the eye. And it's not getting much better. And say, I love you. They're the same words, but there's an entirely different concept of what the meaning of them. And that's what you count it. Now, I don't expect the counts to hold my hand, look in the eye and say, Bill, I love you. But I do expect them to be honest with the level of debt, and I'll be putting in a submission again next year asking for exactly the same thing. I don't like being treated, like all you guys are, as a mushroom. That's right. You've all seen the mushroom sign? All those funny little mushrooms, funny little eyes and ears? Keep me in the dark and feed me on bullshit. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
they chose the topics that were, let's say, of public interest, but they felt they had to investigate further. That is, uh, you, you know, I mean, the, the whole thing would be us about face, if you don't mind me saying so, if there were problems and you were waiting on the council that had created the problem to make the complaint that led to the investigation. So the auditors are free, as far as I'm aware still, to pick the subjects that they are going to uh, investigate and report upon. And I mean, they, they do it all the time. You see the reports, there's probably a couple of audit reports every, uh, every week that Parliament's sitting that are tabled on a variety of subjects. For example, did uh, John Banks act uh, correctly with his fundraising and, and the, the great dot com? I mean, that's an example of something that they think is in the public interest. But there have been very few, and I can't find any in the last two or three years looking through the topics, which I did about uh, a week or, or two ago, of audit office and OAG investigations of local government stuff that you know, really were meaningful. Uh, for example, um, I, I could come up with a half a dozen real hard-hitting topics. They're not easy, but they're matters that I've raised in that uh, in that policy paper that should be the subject of some audit work, investigation, and reporting. For example, start with quote internal borrowing. That one's seemed to have got a, a fair bit of interest around the place, and it's certainly the one in terms of the misuse of reserve funds that would be top of my top five on the list of the things that they could get busy to do. Uh, hi Larry. Hello Crichton, good to see you again. <laughs> yes. Still going around the chat, aren't we? Yes we are. Uh, and you used to hold your document up and say, oh how good we were, but now we don't hold it up and we're a little higher. <laughs> but uh, the internal borrowing is, is a critical issue, and I think you can really speak to the councils here with the B team, who has probably converted, but the A team is now watching rugby. <laughs> So, the question that I want to know about internal borrowing, we have criteria when we have borrowing about amount of debt versus total income percentage like. Should we include internal borrowing into those formulas as well? Well, that, that's... Because it's a part of a debt ratio? Uh, well, I'm glad you raised that because I was going to say before that the auditors and, and the finance people will make damn sure on the face of the balance sheet that the external liabilities owing by the council to third parties is included in the liability side of the balance sheet. <coughs> Don't get that wrong. I mean, the, the, part of the audit process is to say, is to ensure that those liabilities are correctly stated. But what we're saying in terms of this terrible thing, internal borrowing, is that below that level, so you've, you've got the total of Whangarei uh, district council borrowing on the balance sheet and that's all that's ticked off. That's the third party liabilities. But internally where these excess cash reserves have been lying around, what probably isn't accounted for, although you may have some treasury management ratios to manage that and I don't know the detail of that, but at that internal level, the extent to which those funds that were intended for use say in 10 years time have in the meantime been used for other things should be shown within some form of disclosure, either internally or within the accounts. And I think somebody was suggesting that, I think it was Bill, was it, that maybe there should be some disclosures on those sorts of internal transactions. But I wouldn't like it to go away thinking that the actual liabilities are misstated, because they won't be. But in terms of the misuse, if you like, of the, the, the funding that was intended for a replacement of assets, the extent to which that's fully accounted for is, is very much a question uh, for the individual council to decide. And the Treasury management policies and the disclosures, I'm repeating myself, but it's worth repeating, the Treasury management policies and the disclosures of those transactions can be made reasonably clear. Um, but there is no such thing as internal borrowing because there is no, it's not a liability, there's no third party independent of the council to which they owe money. It's just use of the funds that they have internally within their own organisation. Hello everybody. This is right here, it's better. Thank you, Larry, for coming along. I just, I just wanted to answer a question that Bill raised there is about the transparency of our accounts. Um, our monthly accounts are now down to two pages, so I can read two pages and I know exactly where the heartbeat is. Um, but it's go to the long term plan, which Bill is on about, and boy, it's a, it's a minefield. I had to have 
two visits to the, to the uh, our accountant and one to, to my doctor to be before I was sick. <laughs> before I could find my way through it. And so it's taken three years to get the monthly accounts into a very simple slap. It's taken another three years to, to get the long term plan into a, into a state that, that, that is real to mind. It's going to be very So I just sort of uh, thank. Thank you all for raising the point. makes a very good point. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'd just like to contrast that uh, and, and thank you, really. Uh, that, that, that's good, side, good inside information because if, if that's happening in Whangarei, big tick, because it didn't happen in Kaipara, and you can see the upshot of that. There were secret meetings, there were financial transactions that weren't approved. There's a whole raft of stuff that's going to come out in the woodwork. And I'm not suggesting, I haven't tonight, suggesting that Whangarei is, is, um, is acting inappropriately any more so than other councils. And for example, the use of their reserve monies has had that audit tick. It doesn't actually help uh, the people in, in Wellington that are looking for this money now to see whether we can uh, uh, dig ourselves out of the, the recession with local government's assistance. But that's exactly the policy issue that's being discussed at the moment, because if Audit haven't been doing it, why haven't they been doing it? Should they be doing it? That's the direction that the discussion is taking. Next one's Vivian. Um, during the 1990s, when New Zealand was substantially restructured and councils then had to contract out their services, and at the moment we have great calls for austerity and cost cutting, etc. Do you think it would be a good idea for council the services that are now contracted out into the private sector who have to then and therefore make a profit be reabsorbed back into the council? It's very much a horses for courses. Uh, once again, I hate to keep beating up on Kuiper, but within the report of the review team, they made a specific point that Kuiper had taken that far too far, that the institutional knowledge inside the council from employees had disappeared and had been put into the hands largely of engineering consultants. Those engineering consultants came and went. They weren't subject to the, uh, the, the same internal organisational controls that uh, if they'd been an employee was. But this is almost like um, the tide going in, the tide going out, isn't it? Because at one point there was a, a move to contract everything out, and that happened. I think we'll see that some of that is brought back into the council. I personally think the answer is just much more effective and competent uh, contract control. That is, you can't just leave it to an external agency or a, a consultant to represent the council's interest. The council's interest have to be represented by a very competent professional, let's say, works managers. It doesn't mean that you have to have the people on the end of the shovel or on the, uh, behind a, a, a bulldozer wheel um, to uh, to run that whole works thing. But there is there's certainly an extreme that happened at Kuiper where the council lost control of that contracting process. Yeah, hi, um, Frank Newman. Uh, a couple of quick comments, um, Larry. Firstly, the practice with respect to the Wangaroa District Council is that when they do reach the debt limits, uh, all they really do is change the limit rather than change the behaviour. Yes. So um, the other comment about the Wangaroa District Council is that when you compare their long-term community plan, um, that is the 10-year plan, against what is actually achieved in the subsequent 10 years of that plan, there's actually almost no relationship between the two. In fact, when I've looked back, 9 out of 10 years of actually seriously underperformed what they project. So in fact, we can't place any reliance whatsoever on what they project. I've got a question for you. Can I, can I just cover those first two things, Frank? The, the first one was, help me. Oh, it was just a comment about um, that when they breached the debt limit. Oh yes, now, changed. what we've had is the moving of the goalposts every time the debt limit is reached right around the country. The original uh, the debt parameters set maybe five years ago have, have been blown out of the water. The second thing is, it is just a budget, the long-term plan, and they are required by law to report actual against plan on a regular basis, but that doesn't mean the two have to be the same. 
Well, normally in business, you they have probably to should. I mean, if it's a good plan, it should. Well, that's why you do a budget. You <laughs> want to know exactly where you'll be in yeah. one year or ten years' time, and there's no point in doing it if you don't actually yeah. want to get there. Uh, just in terms of a question, then, um, the bottom line really is that what effect is this debt going to have on our rates? You know, that's what we're all sitting here wanting to know because you put a red flag up here about the Longbury District Council. I want to know, well, what effect is that going to have on my rates in the next five or ten years? That's my question, and after that, I've actually got an invitation. <laughs> Frank, um, uh, once again, let's talk budgets. If the, if the, 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 the council had a budget, uh, for somebody such as myself or uh, a colleague or team of colleagues, we could do the math on the effect that, uh, you know, the debt servicing costs on a dollar for dollar basis has on, you know, people's rates. And, and that can be done. It's, it's just arithmetic, really. But I will say this, that there is a correlation, and I've proved it on a number of occasions, it, it's pretty obvious anyway, that Councils with high debt and high debt servicing costs, some as high as 20 cents in the rates dollar. Think about that. That just interest often, because there's very few debt repayment programs abroad at the moment. The, the debt servicing cost has become 20, sometimes more than 20% of the total operating expenditure. So the, the, the uh, inference from that is that those interest costs and debt servicing costs do flow through into rates. In fact, I reckon it's probably the most uh, responsive of the expenditures that actually end up in, in, on your rates. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, high debt councils generally have high rates, so there's something of the proof. Okay, and really my invitation is that we have five existing district councillors, sitting district councillors here tonight. Um, and I'd like to make to invite any one of them actually to um, to um, to tell us um, that if they think the debt is justifiable at the current level, to explain why they think it is. Just before you do that, I haven't made a great play of the fact that it, I did say very briefly that the, the debt that's proposed and the actual debt at the moment, which is one of the same thing on a per rate per basis, is not repeat not amongst the highest in the country. I'd have to go back and look at my numbers again. But um, it's, it's high enough. Um, it's probably as much as this district at the moment can sustain, in my humble opinion, because of the demographics. And that was one of the major reasons why I'm here tonight. That is, if the council is considering further borrowing or further expenditure away from, let's say, the core stuff, then here are the facts, the financial facts, and I did say at the beginning that it's for you to, put you, you to uh, determine whether there's more debt borrowing capacity or not. But I'm sorry, I didn't mean to sort of take over the answers that the, the councillors may or may not want to come up with. I'd like to make a comment on that. Uh, the councillor who's in charge of finance, and do all due respect, Frank, is not here this evening, and as he's the chairman of the finance committee, I think it would be good for these councillors to go back to the council and come back and perhaps publish something in the media so that we can all get an answer. Well, with, with respect, Warren, um, all councillors are in charge of our finances. They shouldn't shirk from their responsibility. And if anyone here thinks that the current debt level is justifiable, they should say so now. Let's be comment. Take the win. Yep. <coughs> Who wants to have the first shot of it? Councillor Christie. Too high and I voted against it, and I only won an annual, you voted against the long-term plan. Yeah, um, honestly, uh, thanks, Ian. Yeah, honestly, look, I'm not comfortable with it, personally. Um, I can't claim to have voted against the long-term plan like Crichton, but we have to have a plan. You work, you work to formulate it the best way you can, and what you come up with largely is, is what you come up with and, and to a certain degree you have to live with it. But as far as the, the debt level goes, look, I continue to vote against unpopular and unnecessary projects that are pushing our debt up. And if everyone had voted like me, it would be $30 million down on what our debt figure is. So think about, um, so we need to think about that. There's some sacred, sacred cows in terms of um, projects that have been planned for a long time that people aren't willing to let go of. 
And if we were willing to reassess those, we could bring that debt way down. Interesting, there's um, oh, I'm here today, and an ARS here today, but who's not here today is the standard supporters. I think if we look to them, they said they mark us on five points. Three were good, but the most important ones, two were bad. One was high debt, the other was poor <coughs> budgetary performance. And both were hand in hand. And that, in a, in a short sentence, is where I stand on our financial position. Yeah, thank you again. I didn't know that. I'm, I'm, I think you have to look at debt and overall financial position in its total picture, not just debt by itself. And I don't think you need to look at debt as an individual in the same way as you might look at uh, or a company in the same way as you might look at a local authority. A local authority has got a responsibility beyond just the length of our life, for instance. You've got to continue to have those assets over a long period of time. So, you know, so it's a total picture. At this stage, I'm comfortable with our debt level uh, in terms of its financial prudence, you know, uh, in terms of the measures of uh, our, interest rate, our interest costs against total rates and those sorts of measures, I'm reasonably comfortable where we're at at the moment. Doesn't mean to say it can't be um, better, um, but I'm, I'm not uncomfortable with the picture that it looks like at the moment. Rate increases are budgeted for around about 3% per year over the, uh, the 10 year plan and an overall debt level at the end of those 10 years at about the same as it is at the moment. So, when you look at the total picture, I'm not uncomfortable with where we're at. Yeah, very well said because um, the, the, the policy that's being developed at the moment uh, by people in um, the financial circles of the DIA uh, to set up some uh, benchmarks, financial benchmarks, and included in those will be a high, medium, and low ratio, let's say, because it will be a financial ratio. For example, the proportion of debt interest to total rates revenue. So that it won't be long within the next two or three years uh, where ratepayer groups like this will become familiar with what is seen as an acceptable, let's say, middle point of that ratio. And so councils will be accountable, hopefully, around those benchmarks. And you can determine, hopefully, because they will be, they, not hopefully, they will be disclosed in public accounts in a table form so that you see that the high is a certain figure, the medium uh, percentage of, let's say, debt interest to uh, uh, rates of revenue is the middle point, and there's a low point. Ours is this, it was this last year, this is what we planned for it to be in the next year. Now that's accountability, isn't it? You can't get much better than that, it's coming. And I, I think there are many councils, particularly at the internal level, which is probably what the, the councils are seeing, can say they're comfortable with debt at this certain level, but by hokey they'll be pretty careful that if it goes above that to start uh, dealing with the ratepayer groups, to talk to the media, to be involved in discussions about what is an appropriate a maximum level of debt based on those ratios. They have been there in the past, but we've just said, for example, and uh, Frank has pointed out the fact that they keep changing on us. You know, the maximum debt levels keep, keep shifting. And you can see from the debt graphs that I've come up with that the increase in debt has been inexorable, hasn't it? There hasn't been a debt repayment program for a long time. Well, hello, the world's changed. We're in a recession now. The global financial crisis is, is affecting us all, and it's not just a matter of the same old, same old. So those ratios, when they come in, will be very vital for us to see Maybe not a maximum debt level, but let's see if we can get down to a minimum one. Remember, $1,500 per ratepayer was the maximum prudent debt level for planning purposes. Now, I was just thinking um, before the meeting that you could probably use a multiplier over the last 14 years or so of about 2.5 on that 1500 for today's dollars. So it's going to be around about the 4000 4500 mark, which is where Whangarais is. So thank you for that. And I mean, I think that brings some of the balance back to this meeting because I didn't want to, you people going away to say that 
uh, to, to, with the feeling that uh, there's a, a, a calamity just around the corner. But the message really, particularly based on the plans of the council at the moment, is be careful out there. Right, we've got the last question here from Jeremy, and then we'll get on to the Epsom T questions. Thank you. And my name's Jeremy Bush, and I'm one of the five that sit in the back row at the council meetings. And uh, Robin Weaver and of course us agitators. Oh, Robin, he's still around, is he? <laughs> and uh, Pat Slater says you can't have clean washing unless you've got agitators. <laughs> um, one of my questions is about this international reporting system. As I understand it, it was developed more for international businesses. And so my first question is, why in the hell is a local government like Wamaray District Council spending all the ratepayers' money on having this fancy accounting system when it's really designed for people that are in the export business and trying to keep their accounting to suit um, international markets? That's question one. I'll answer that if I may. Yeah. Um, I, I stand corrected again on this, but the departing Auditor General, a bloke by the name of Kevin Brady, in his last two or three months in the job, basically canned IFRS for public sector reporting. So what we're getting at the moment, I, I can't, I haven't followed the, the whole detail of it, but it is certainly a hell of a lot less than would be required if we had the full nine yards of those standards. But it is still far too complicated, and I know that there's a project underway for further simplification, major simplifications, uh, of, of uh, uh, council uh, external reporting. Thank you. My second question is the relationship between CEO, the pop, um, bureaucrat and the politician, and here we have a merging, and I think that's personally wrong, and I think that because I'm invested in many uh, public companies, and I think that there's a board of directors, and there's a management team, the management team reports to the board of directors, the board of directors, in this case, the Wangari District Council, which is a multi-million dollar enterprise, um, sets a budget, the CEO should go away and make sure that budget's adhered to, and if the councillors decide to play around with the budget, the CEO says, should say, you employ me to run the council to the budget, and if you want to change the budget, do it in the next draft annual plan or the next long-term plan. Am I, is that the way we should run things, or am I wrong? Uh, sounds pretty good to me. Um, the, uh, the paragraphs on governance in the review team report at Kaipra are absolutely spot on the money. I suggest that every elected member gets to have a read of that, because um, it, it's almost the opposite of what, what you suggested, to the point that, uh, and I don't know how far this will go, but the team has suggested that the affairs of Kaipra, and for that matter it could relate to many other councils, that those affairs are monitored by a Crown appointee. So that the central government are that concerned about what's going on, perhaps distrustful of uh, council management in particular and the governance structure, less particular, um, that they said we're going to have a Crown appointee to ride herd on what happens at Kaipra. Now that means that we've got to look, I think, again at the position of the CEO as the sole employer. Um, this was a reaction, of course, to the opposite situation 10 years ago when councillors were meddling in the detail of council business. Now we seem that the pendulum has swung to the other end where they don't even get a look in because of something of what's in the advocate <laughs> article that I've pointed uh, you toward today. And, and it's a human relationship problem, but the legislation at the moment, and I don't want to be quoted on this, but it possibly gives too much power to one generally man. Exactly. <laughs> All right, we've got three questions. Clint will uh, get up. Larry, would you like to bring it up on the screen? There's <coughs> three people that are away, and the first question is from Colin Davis, and he says, you may like to ask this anonymously. But I didn't think it was necessary. <laughs> Because no one knows Colin Davis, did it? And the question that he asked was, if the design life of sealed roads is 25 to 30 years, 
and the budget to rehabilitate those roads at the end of their design life is not sufficient, which then pushes the projected life of the roads out for further than design, this would constitute a liability on the books, would it not? Answer, it would not. And if so, why is it not showing and why has the auditor not tagged the accounts for such liability? If you count the kilometres of sealed roads and the budget for rebuilds, it would suggest imminent collapse due to insufficient funding, or if it is devaluing of an asset, it would reach insolvency or may have passed it already. Well, I'd, I'd just like to say that that insufficient funding, that insufficient funding is what we've been talking to tonight. Um, but uh, no, I, I, I should have a bit of a chat to Colin and do some. Uh, double entry T accounts like we used to in the old accounting days because um, there's a bit of a, a mixture in that question, it's a difficult question to address but certainly if, if this insufficient funding arises from the, uh, the internal borrowing and, and, and the shenanigans that have been going on then he, that's possibly what he's driving at. Okay, uh, second question. Where's the second question? Which is from Charlie and he's a rate payer from Hikarangi. And he asks, Larry, we hear a great deal about a policy of internal borrowing by a council. Is this a rational and optimal way of managing council funds? Please explain in simple terms, if possible, because it is all very confusing to a layman or woman. Well, I think we've covered that, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, haven't we? Okay, great. Okay. I said I'd bring, read them out. The third question is from a staff member of council from Kensington. What was his name? <laughs> <laughs> it says, Larry, I understand that the WDC declined over this in the past three years. Your offer to present to the elected members and management your vital stats analysis, which we have just been treated to. Why do you think this happened, and does this attitude, in your view, have any relationship to your firm's <laughs> league table and the coverage given to council affairs by the Northern African? Well, I guess I would say this. I'd personally like to declare an interest in the answer to this question because I do market my products. And um, I've, I've got to say that, if anything, I, I have been an abject failure on the basis that uh, the marketing uh, in the last year has been just barely enough to keep a, a fly alive. Now, either that's indicating that the stuff that I'm producing is absolute CRAP, which I don't believe it is because there's no other comparative type performance measurement around, uh, so it's a bit of a default. Um, or councils are, are genuinely, um, perhaps not genuine is the right word, but they, they are disinterested in the stuff that I've got. I would have thought that um, that's the, the sort of vital information that councils need to get at least once every two or three years anyway, um, for having a basis of understanding what the dynamics of each of their of, of the district is, and uh, the, the ten biggies, for example, covers the relative rates levels, the debt levels, the uh, the mix of operating and, and expenditure, the proportion of rates that's taken as a proportion of the total revenue, the mini GDP. So there's a lot of gold in there. Perhaps it's my marketing that's at fault because I would hope that in the next few years um, the many of the councils will take these reports or a better product, but certainly to take a much high, more heightened interest in improving their performance, as I've already mentioned. Okay, right, yeah. So what we're going to do now is probably go away tonight and think about where to from here. So if people have any ideas, I think it's pretty important to uh, sort of voice those ideas through the media. Uh, let us to the editor usually get some good responses. And it's to keep the issue alive. If people aren't happy about certain things, it's, it's to keep it alive. So that comes us to the end tonight. So there's a few things I want to say thanks. I want, I want to firstly um, thank the volunteers that have helped out. And, and I'm just going to run through the names, just the Christian names. There's Steve, and Dean, and Vivian, and Alan, and Colin, and Wayne, and Pat. It's Pat, that's my wife. She's done quite a bit to help. Um, Owen, Jeremy, Lorraine, and Brian, and Claire, and Jim. So thanks to all those. Mm -hmm. and, also and a big thank you, of course, to, to Warren. Let's give him a big hand. I'd like to thank the 
media they were all invited and uh, sent invitations and I know some of them have followed up with interviews with Larry we've got Radio New Zealand here this evening thank you very much the advocate they put an article in the paper the other day and supported the meeting getting you know, get people along and also to the Whangarei leader so special thanks to them but I think the most important thing would be two more people to thank the first one and I really want everyone to give a good round of applause to all you people for coming out tonight. To listen. Thank you. Very, very important to be out. But a special thanks to Larry. Larry normally charges councils um, a fee to come up. The councils up here didn't want him. And he said to us, I'll come up, I'll give my time. He's staying at what's that top hotel? <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's come up here. If you haven't already given to the Kaha collection tonight, please do so. And you know, I'd rather a big round of applause to Larry and thank you very much, Larry. <laughs> so, thanks again to everyone for coming. There's tea and coffee and refreshments in there over there, some cold juice. Um, thanks again. And please drive safely home. Thank you very much. Thank you.